we have a guest today. This is the first time I'm inviting someone to this course, and I think it's going to be fun. Uh, John Furtuna is a PhD candidate um, in the Safari Research Group at ETH Zurich. Uh, he is advised by Professor Onur Mutlu. He's an expert in uh, computer architecture. He obtained his uh, BS and uh, MS degrees in computer engineering from Bitkent University. And this is where I know from John. Um, John and I met, uh, he was an undergraduate when we first met. He was one of the most enthusiastic, smart, and capable undergraduates. We even have a paper uh, when he was an undergraduate. He contributed to one of our papers, and he's the second author in that paper. He had a couple of papers uh, from his undergraduate years, right? And afterwards, <laughs> A uh, master's and PhD has been very productive. He has been publishing uh, broadly in bioinformatics and computer architecture topics, but he he, he has a very uh, fruitful PhD going on, and he will be graduating soon, um, hopefully in summer, and will be starting to look for positions. So um, keep an eye on where he lands on. It might be useful for your future career as well. So his current research is... Um, uh, in bioinformatics and computer architecture, and it, it includes accurately and quickly identifying sequence similarities, real-time genome analysis, hardware, software, co-design for accelerating bioinformatics workloads, correcting sequence errors, developing computational tools for genome editing. So he's um, generally interested in developing new algorithms and architectures for bioinformatics applications to enable fast and accurate genome analysis, which is a much needed thing in our days. So I'll leave the screen to you, John. Welcome and thank you. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Ezrajan, for really kind and nice introduction. And I also want to perhaps uh, highlight the fact that I actually, I had my very first research experience with you and it was really fun and uh, I had many opportunities, let's say great opportunities to learn also about bioinformatics and uh, uh, I guess clearly this <laughs> has led to many other like fruitful outcomes afterwards, so I should really thank you uh, for that and also for the opportunity uh, for today. And again, thanks for the introduction. And so this means that I don't even have to show this slide to you. So I like a brief introduction of, of self, but uh, what I want to really show is if you want to learn more about our group and our research, you can uh, use this website. And uh, also you can contact me using my email address or my website, or also you can follow me on Twitter to see my academic tweets as well. And uh, again, our group uh, is led by Professor Mutlu. Uh, uh, as Özdemir Hocam said, he's a, a professor at ETH Zurich, and also he's currently a visiting professor at Stanford University. And uh, in our group, we are 40 plus uh, researchers. So we work on many topics, including computer architecture, systems, bioinformatics, security, and so on. And our motto is think big and aim high. And we have uh, four key directions in our group, but today I'll mainly focus on the fourth direction, which is designing algorithms and architectures for important applications such as AI, ML, genomics, and medicine. So this is our uh, agenda uh, for today. So I'll uh, first give you some background on uh, high-level background on sequence analysis, and also I'll give you some background on uh, what is essentially the role of for signal analysis and how we achieve how we can do real-time analysis of uh, sequencing data. And then I'll move on to our, uh, our recent works uh, that enables fast and accurate real-time analysis that we call raw hash and raw hash two. And then I'll I'll conclude. Can so I that, forgot to ask, uh, can they ask a question in the middle of the lecture or should they wait? Yes, of course. So just shout out at any point if you have any questions. So I'll be happy, more than happy to answer them at any point. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm pretty sure you already covered, uh, let's say, uh, why sequence analysis or genome analysis is important. But I, again, want to quickly uh, show you to motivate, let's say, for this lecture. So it's, sequence analysis is really important for many reasons, right? For example, for understanding the genetic variations, species, uh, people around us, and health and evolution and so on. It also is very important for predicting the pa presence of uh, certain pathogens. So that can be very harmful for our health, right, in an environment, which is also, again, very important for, for example, surveillance of uh, disease outbreaks, which we actually experienced very recently with, with COVID-19, right? And of course, since this sequencing data is very personalized data, very critical data for, for our health, so this can also be used for personalized medicine and also many, many other applications uh, that, that you can think of. Uh, 
But then how do we start this sequence analysis, right? How do we do that analysis? So it usually starts with uh, converting the biological data, uh, let's say, into its uh, uh, digital form. And this is usually done by uh, the machines that we call high throughput uh, sequencing machines. So these machines take these biological molecules, for example, DNA as input, and then it uh, uh, converts them into their digital format, or which are basically sequences of characters that we can use for analysis. And we usually call these uh, uh, fragments uh, from the DNA reads, right? And we usually have, as you also may probably know, uh, uh, some uh, uh, fundamental challenges uh, for this sequencing data, which is one, uh, we don't know usually the origin of these reads in the corresponding genome. And also these are fragments from the genome, right? So we cannot really generate a genome size or chromosome size uh, uh, fragments, uh, let's say from, uh, from, the, from the biological molecule itself, if you are especially interested in whole genome uh, sequencing and analysis. So then uh, uh, essentially the, uh, the sequence comparison then is really at the core of, of genome analysis or sequence analysis. Uh, so that we can uh, resolve uh, uh, these challenges with the sequencing data. And I really like to use this uh, puzzle solving analogy when explaining this uh, sequence comparison uh, 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 approach in, in genome analysis. So our goal is usually is to analyze sequences by accurately and quickly comparing them, right? So you can assume that these are pieces from a puzzle or pieces from your DNA, and then we want to compare them maybe to each other. Right, so you can check each uh, piece to each other and then maybe make some meaning out of it, right? So you may see what uh, this uh, uh, set of data looks like. Or we may have a template sequence, for example, a reference genome. So you can use it as a, maybe a reference point and then you can figure out where each piece uh, uh, belongs to in, in that particular reference genome. And it's really essentially uh, uh, sequence comparison and then the further downstream analysis is really essential for understanding the functionality of a sequence, the mutations and diseases and, and so on. So we use it for many applications. Then uh, how do we do this uh, sequence comparison, right? So I'll show you two ways. One way will be very naive approach uh, of doing it and the second way will be a practical approach doing it. So we have this uh, uh, term or step that we call read mapping. And the goal is really to figure out where uh, a read, let's say here, belongs to in its corresponding reference genome. So this is usually referred to as the mapping step. So you identify the region that it belongs to, and you can also optionally do the alignment step, which will tell you, let's say, the exact differences between a read and a particular region in the reference genome, for example, the substitutions, insertions, and deletions, and so on. And this step is usually very costly. So if you really want to do, let's say, a naive approach, what you would do is you would check every position, let's say, in, in the read and also every position in the reference genome, and then you would do it for all the reads that you have in your read set. But this is extremely expensive because you usually have millions of reads and you have to do it, let's say, for every uh, uh, character, every base in the read and every base in the reference genome. So this is not really practical, right? And of course, people usually follow a different and more practical approach to do so. Uh, so I'll show you this reference genome again, maybe in a, a finer granularity. So we have reference genome here, and this may be, let's say, relatively large. For example, it can contain 3 billion bases, 3 billion characters in the case of human reference genome, and then you also have your read. So the practical reference uh, read mapping usually contains four main steps. In the first step, we have this uh, uh, step called indexing. And what we do here is that uh, uh, we construct, we use a certain data structure that we call hash table. And what we really do is that uh, we extract certain k-mers from the reference genome, and we uh, essentially store them in the hash table along with their locations that they, where they appear in the reference genome, right? So we do it for the, for the KMRs that we extract from the reference genome so that we can use this index later on for practical search uh, when we're querying the read. So then you have this hash table that we call indexing, and this is an offline step, one-time task for reference genome. And then what happens is that when you want to, let's say, identify where a read may belong to in the reference genome, what you do is you again extract a, a KMRs of certain size, again, from the read, now what you really do is that you literally go and query the hash table very quickly with these k right? So it's 
much more efficient than performing alignment. Uh, 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 here, what we do is a direct lookup of k-mers, and then we identify, let's say, uh, uh, the matching regions between the k-mers and the reference genome, and this becomes our potential matching regions or candidate regions in the reference genome. But again, some regions may be low quality, some regions may not be really, let's say, similar to read and so on. So we apply in the third step, uh, uh, certain algorithms, for example, uh, filtering, maybe frequency filter, or maybe even chaining that identifies the chain of uh, many seed matches and so on, so that we can really reduce, let's say, uh, uh, further reduce the candidate regions we have in the reference genome. And in the last step, uh, hopefully we have now fewer regions uh, that we can check in the reference genome, and what we do is that we perform this alignment step, which is approximate string matching using dynamic programming table, right? And what it does, it, it gives you, uh, let's say, the insertions, deletions, and substitutions uh, between a read and the reference genome so that you can tell whether uh, this read is really similar to that region that you're looking at in the reference genome. So this is basically one uh, common way of doing read mapping, a practical way of doing read mapping uh, for sequence analysis. But again, the sequencing output that we're generating uh, uh, from these high throughput machines also create certain challenges, right? So I'll again use this puzzle analogy, and in this case, we have a different uh, uh, image here. So we usually have uh, two types of sequencing data. One type is usually uh, 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 where we have short fragments, short reads, right? This is usually coming from uh, Illumina machine, Illumina sequencer. And also we have, we might have larger pieces of a puzzle, right, or, or larger fragments from the sequencing machine. And this usually comes from a nanopore sequencer or pack bio. So the question is, so which sequencing technology we, we should really use, right? So as it so happens, there are again, like uh, uh, certain trade-offs to decide on which one is the best. So the challenge with Illumina data is, so when you're solving a puzzle and when your pieces are really small, it is really relatively more challenging to solve that uh, puzzle, right? Because you may not know where that piece belongs to in the in the in the reference genome or in the puzzle. Uh, uh, so when you have larger pieces, this is relatively easier to solve the puzzle. But again, uh, these pieces, the larger pieces that we get from Nanopore and PacBio, it, it, they usually contain a high error rate. So the sequencer itself introduces errors in the fragments in the reads that it uh, generates. So this is currently usually around 5%, but this has been getting lower uh, up to 1% in the recent years. But again, if you use long reads, there's a high chance that depending on the coverage data that you're generating, the, the puzzle that you're solving may not be the correct puzzle. Let's say you may generate an incorrect uh, 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 image at the end or uh, genome information at the end. So the, the, the essentially the uh, differences between the data type, the accuracy read length is usually coming from, let's say, the, the inner workings of these uh, sequencers. So each sequencer works in a different way. So for example, Illumina generates a certain uh, set of images. So by looking at the images, you tell whether there's the A or T at a, a certain position of a read. Uh, here, Nanopore generates electrical signals that hopefully tells, let's say, uh, by, by looking at these electrical signals, you can hopefully tell which base that you're sequencing at a time and so on. And today, we're going to focus more on this uh, nanopore sequencing data, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so nanopore sequencing is one of the very widely used sequencing technology uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the community, and it has due to essentially certain advantages. So one big advantage is it can generate long reads, up to 2 million nucleotides. So single read can uh, be of like 2 million bases. Uh, so other advantages, so these machines, these sequencers can be really small. So you can really fit it in your palm, right? So it, that this provides some portable sequencing, uh, 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 let's say benefits. So you may literally carry the sequencer with you and then maybe you can sequence using your mobile device or your, uh, your personal computer. So this is also relatively cost effective and also it provides some certain unique features that don't exist in, in other sequencers that are enabled by real-time analysis. And I'll uh, show you how real-time analysis and nanopore sequencing uh, works. 
so here, uh, what you're seeing is essentially an image uh, of or animation of, of uh, a real-time sequencing of a DNA using uh, nanopore sequencing technology. So what we have here is that we have, a, let's say, a DNA here is a biological molecule. We have a DNA here. This is getting sequenced, right? And then uh, what happens is that we have a three-layer, let's say, uh, 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 solution over there. So you can assume we have three layers here. So what's happening is that we apply uh, a certain voltage at a certain direction uh, here in the solution such that the top layer becomes negatively charged and the bottom layer becomes positively charged. In the middle, we have this membrane that holds this tiny pore that we call monopore. Right? So what's happening here is really is since DNA is also negatively charged and due to the electromagnetic forces, this particular DNA is literally moving from the negatively charged side to the positively charged side. And as it moves through this particular nanopore, uh, uh, DNA essentially attaches to this particular nanopore using this certain, uh, let's say, adapters or proteins. And as it moves through, it actually uh, generates uh, 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 current measurements, let's say, uh, uh, as DNA passes through this particular nanopore at a certain speed. And the speed here is really it, it generates around 5,000 electrical samples. And these samples are really, let's say, integer numbers from 0 to 200. And uh, this usually translates into uh, 500 uh, uh, bases. So this, you can then assume that it actually uh, generates 10 electrical signals per single base. Uh, we have relatively nice uh, resolution here. So I'm seeing also some maybe things in the chat, but I guess, okay. Uh, so. Then, so this data, this electrical data is generated. It is generated at a certain speed. And you can use it actually in real time as well while this electrical data is generated. So how you can use it? So this data is generated in real time, as I said. And uh, you can, what you can do is you can translate these electrical signals into bases, right? So which is known as the base calling step. And then you can do your regular analysis with read mapping and the other steps, right? And if your computation approach is fast enough, then such that you can uh, essentially perform your analysis while data is generated, you can do your real-time analysis. Or the other approach, you don't even translate these uh, uh, electrical signals into bases, but rather directly use these electrical signals for analysis, and then you can still do your uh, real-time analysis. So why real-time as analysis is important? Because of two reasons that I'll explain uh, next, but one reason is you can actually perform uh, real-time decisions. Uh, you can give feedback to the sequencer uh, uh, itself. For example, uh, assume that you have a sample, right? And in your sample, you are really interested in, let's say, the, the human uh, reads uh, that you have. But that sample might be contaminated by other organisms, maybe bacteria, right? And then you don't really want to sequence that bacterial organism, bacterial read, because it won't be useful for your analysis, right? So what you can do is that in, if in real time, if you can tell the read that you're uh, sequencing is not coming from a human genome, you can tell the sequencer to stop sequencing that particular read. So what it will do is that actually it will stop sequencing it. And then uh, you can actually uh, benefit from it a lot. I'll explain next, but I want to also show you that this approach is not magic. Right? So what happens is that as soon as you give the feedback to the nanopore sequencer, what's happening is that it actually applies the voltage in the other direction such that now the top layer becomes positively charged and the bottom layer becomes negatively charged. So what happens is that now the DNA actually will move outside of this pore. So it will eject from the pore. So in this sense, you'll actually stop further sequencing that read and um, then, then you can move on to other read, let's say. <laughs> So let me show you the benefits of this real-time analysis with real-time decisions, right? So one uh, benefit is that in your most common case, what you usually do is you first sequence, and then once your sequence is done, then you do your analysis. Excuse me. <laughs> so this means that uh, you have to wait for the sequencing to finish, right? But in real-time analysis, you can actually overlap the sequencing with analysis, right? So this means that you can actually reduce the latency of entire genome analysis by, over, by this overlapping uh, uh, benefit. The second benefit is that, again, in your most common case, you have to sequence your entire uh, read. 
you don't have any mechanism, let's say, for other sequencers to tell, oh, I don't want to stop, uh, I, I want to stop that particular uh, sequencing, that particular read. But with Nanopore, you can do this. So this means that you can partially sequence the read if it is not interesting to you, or maybe sequencing that amount of phases is enough for you. So this means that you can actually reduce the sequencing time and also cost a lot by doing so. Uh, this is basically achieved by this uh, uh, early uh, decision or uh, real-time decision mechanisms with Nanopore that I just explained. But again, there are certain, uh, let's say, uh, challenges to it to achieve real-time analysis. One challenge is you need to do re rapid analysis so that we can match the data generation speed, right? We need to make timely decisions, meaning we want to stop sequencing the read as early as possible because we don't want to sequence unnecessarily. Uh, so we want to make acute analysis, of course, uh, and the raw signals, raw electrical signals are usually noisy. And also, especially in the case of portable sequencing, we want to really do power efficient computation, meaning we don't really want to rely on these high computational resources if you are going to end up using your mobile device or personal computer and so on. Uh, so that you can do it in, uh, in, uh, in a portable manner, let's say. So I'll show you one more slide as a background so that you can understand some, let's say, uh, low level details about these electrical signals and how we can use this for analysis purposes. So in non pore, right, so I showed you that particular pore that was sequencing uh, at reason, right? So, so at a time, we usually actually have inside the pore, we have k mini nucleotides or k mers right? And what's happening is that actually we don't, generate electrical signals for a single base, but actually we generate electrical signals for that k many nucleotides at a time, right? And it actually moves uh, during sequencing. So uh, so this means that, uh, so, and also depending on the chemistry or the model of the nanopore that you're using, it usually contains from six characters to nine characters within, within a nanopore. And so we have this term that we call event. So event actually is nothing but essentially a segment in the electrical signal that is generated by this nanopore. So in this plot, what you see here is these electrical signals that are generated at a time, and the values are essentially picoamperes. Again, as I said, these are values between zero and 200. And so this event actually corresponds to a sequencing of a particular k that we assume. So while, while you're sequencing that KMR, you're going to generate several let's say, electrical signals, and then you assume that that event actually corresponds to that particular KMR. And now what happens is that when you when this particular KMR moves, and this means that this G goes out of that pore, and maybe the new base comes in, there is usually an abrupt signal change uh, in the output that we're seeing in electrical signals. So this usually signals a sequencing of a new KMR, let's say, at a time. And then we can use statistical methods to uh, find these abrupt changes in the signal, right? So that we can identify the sequencing of a, of a new camera. And then uh, we essentially take the average of these signals, and then we say this is an event value, and then we use these event values for uh, comparison purposes so that we can tell, okay, this event value maybe may belong to that particular camera and so on. But there's one key observation here. Uh, and the, the, the key observation here is that when you're sequencing identical KMERs, right? Maybe you have ACTGG, and then you're sequencing it at different times, right? So we don't actually generate exactly the same electrical signal. So this means that you're not going to generate exactly the one of five, right? Every time you sequence the same KMER, but we will generate similar, let's say, uh, signals. Meaning maybe if you sequence ACTTGG at a later time, maybe the signals that you're generating will be uh, uh, 106, maybe 107, 104. So it will be a close value. So this is a key observation that you should keep in mind for later slides. So with that, uh, I'll move on to uh, uh, our recent works, RawHash and RawHash2, to tell you basically how we use these utilities, uh, features from nanopore sequencing and, and, and uh, do analysis, let's say, in real time. So RawHash was uh, presented at ISMB uh, and ECCB last year, and it was also published in the proceedings of, of, uh, of ISMB and ECCB. So you can reach the paper and also our code using these uh, QR codes. And these slides are available. I guess maybe Özner Hocam will also send them soon, and they are available also on my website as well. Uh, so, but I'll give you some quick executive summary of raw hash. So the problem that we're dealing is the real-time analysis of raw nanopore signals is usually inaccurate or inefficient when it comes to analyzing large genomes. And our goal is actually 
make this fast and accurate for large genomes. And we have two key contributions in our work. One contribution is we provide the first hash phase mechanism uh, to quickly and accurately analyze raw signals for large genomes. And we also propose a mechanism that we call sequence until that can actually accurately and dynamically stop the entire sequencing run, not a sequencing of a single read, but the entire run of sequencing, if we decide that further sequencing is actually not necessary for, the, for your analysis. And we show uh, key results using uh, three use cases and also five genomes of varying sizes. And we show that raw hash provides significant improvements in the performance and the speed, uh, which is throughput in this case, compared to state-of-the-art works. And also it improved the accuracy also by 1.15x and 2.13x compared to, again, these works for large genomes. And we also show that the mechanism, the sequence until mechanism that we're showing in our paper actually can reduce the sequencing time and cost by 15x. So I'll show you the prior works and how they do real-time analysis. Uh, so there are two types of uh, and, uh, the uh, prior works that uh, uh, perform real-time analysis. One is essentially translating these electrical signals to bases, right? You can use DNNs, and then you can do your usual analysis, uh, read mapping, and so on. Nothing new about this. So this means that these base code sequences are usually less noisy. They are more accurate, and you can do more accurate analysis, perhaps, right? But Using these DNNs are usually very costly, and they require power-hungry uh, uh, computations, let's say, to, to perform base calling. Maybe you need to use GPUs, right? Uh, so other type of appro other, uh, uh, approach is not base call, but rather directly map these raw signals somehow to reference genomes without base calling. And there are two main benefits to it. One benefit is raw signals usually contain richer information than just bases, right? It contains, it can give you maybe information about the, the chemical structure of, of the DNA. It can tell you whether there's a methylation and so on. Like there are basically richer information in the raw signal that we're using. So you can somehow utilize them. And you can also do efficient analysis with better scalability and portability because we're not base calling them. But then what is the problem with, let's say, mapping raw signals, right? So here there is a raw signal and then you want to map it maybe to a small genome or a large genome. So when it comes to a small genome, uh, per read, you have fewer regions to check in a second, let's say. So this means that maybe you can do accurate mapping and you can do fast mapping because you only have few regions that you can check at a time. But when it comes to large genomes, uh, as the genome size increases, also, the number of regions that you need to analyze per read increases substantially. But again, you're generating the data at a certain throughput, but now you have more computations to do so, then how can you do this fast enough such that you can still do real-time analysis, right? Uh, there are two main problems to it. One problem is there are certain probabilistic early works, probabilistic mechanisms, and when you have many regions to check, these probabilistic mechanisms become very inaccurate. The other approach is uh, they, they perform distance calculation between raw signals. But again, this distance calculation is so costly that when it comes to large reference genomes, uh, it, they don't become being uh, uh, real time, but rather uh, they lose their real time features. So we conclude that existing solutions are either inaccurate or inefficient for large genomes. So we, raw hash, again, our goal is to enable uh, this fast and accurate analysis, especially for large genomes. So to this end, we propose raw hash. Raw hash is the provides the first hash based mechanism, and also it, uh, we show uh, we provide a new let's say sequencing mechanism that we call sequence until to stop sequencing dynamically uh, 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 at runtime. So I'll first show you how we perform this first first hash based search. Again, so remember our key observation: uh, identical nucleotides generate similar raw signals, not exactly the same, and the earlier works utilizes this information. And what it, what it does is that it performs distance calculation. Maybe it performs Euclidean distance calculation between signals. And if the distance is small between these, uh, between these signals, then it signals you. It tells you maybe these signals are coming from the same camera. Then maybe you can say, OK, since it's the same camera, I can, do, I can do my mapping accordingly. But this becomes very costly, as I said, for larger genomes because distance calculation is really costly. What we really want to do is that we somehow generate hash values from these raw signals such that these hash values are actually the same when these signals are similar to each other so that you can perform 
fast match by just uh, quickly directly matching these hash values to each other without performing the distance calculation. There are three challenges to it. One I already said, we really need to generate same hash value for similar enough signals, right? This is challenging. So because you usually have low collision hash functions. The second challenge is that we don't really want to generate uh, too many matches, let's say, too many candidate regions with these hash value matches. Rather, we want to also generate accurately, we want to find accurately as few similar regions as possible so that the rest of the steps in read mapping is also practical. So this is the overview of, of raw hash. We usually start with converting the reference genome and electrical signals to event values that I described earlier. And then we perform quantization to reduce the resolution and the noise in the electrical signals. And then we somehow generate hash values from these quantized values, and then we do mapping later on. And the, the steps on the left is the indexing step. It is an offline step. You do it once. And the steps on the right, you do it in real time. And this is referred to as the mapping step. So I'll start with the reference to event and the signal to event conversion. So reference to event conversion is actually relatively pretty simple. Uh, we know, let's say, our nanopore chemistry, maybe it sequences six bases, six cameras at a time. So what we literally do is that we extract six mers, these cameras from reference genome. And then we also have this lookup table that tells us what is the expected event value for each camer from a nanopore, right? And what we do is that we use this lookup table that we call camer model, and this is pre-constructed based on the characteristics of the nanopore sequencer. And then we use this model to essentially generate these event values from camers. And then we do some normalization so that we can enable uh, matching later on and so on. But this is really basically character to signal conversion uh, uh, from the reference genome. So we convert the reference into signal base. Then we also do this uh, similar approach for raw signals that we have. So we, what we do is we really need to go from this pure raw signal to the series of events, which will tell us maybe the uh, cameras from the raw signal. Uh, so we, to this side, we perform event detection that identify these abrupt changes in the signal. And to do so, we, we use statistical test. It is known as student's t-test, let's say which is also known as the segmentation step in this raw signal uh, analysis. So this test spots abrupt signal changes, and each abrupt signal change corresponds to an uh, event, let's say, for us in the signal. And then similarly, as we did with reference genome, we, come, we uh, generate event values and normalize them and so on. So then the question is, or, so now we have these consecutive events, right, which translates into consecutive cameras, right? So then the question is, now we have these consecutive cameras, then can we directly these match signals uh, to each other, let's say, to uh, identify these candidate regions? So to answer this, I'll uh, uh, explain our quantization mechanism and why this is necessary. Again, for the third time, remember our observation that there are slight differences in raw signals when you're uh, sequencing the identical camera. In this case, for example, we have CTA, TTA, and then when you're sequencing at different times, you might generate different flow signals. But again, these are going to be close to each other. So what you can, the challenge here is that you cannot directly match these event values to each other because it won't be feasible and inaccurate. Our key idea is actually quantize or bucket uh, these uh, uh, event values such that uh, similar event values are quantized into or bucketed into the same value in a sense that we can actually use these for matching purposes, but not these, right? So this is the quantization idea in, in, in raw hash. But again, so how do we do, how do we generate the hash values from these quantized values so that we can do the rest of the read mapping step uh, as we usually do? Uh, so we do hashing for fast similarity search, but there is one key challenge. Uh, events usually represent very small cameras from six to nine characters. And if you want to match this single quantized value, it is likely that you're going to, these short cameras are likely to appear in many regions in the reference genome. So it may appear in thousands or millions of regions if you are using these very short cameras, very short cameras. So the question is, how can we make this larger? <laughs> so our key idea is we want to form longer cameras. And how do we do it? We actually uh, uh, essentially use or concatenate consecutive events to each other so that we can form these longer cameras. So what we do is, assume you have these consecutive event values or quantized values in your raw signal, we pack these together 
So these each quantized value usually is a five bit value. So you can pack them together into maybe 64 bit value or 60 bit value such that they form a longer k-mer. And then this is what we actually hash. This is what we, the, the, the hash way that we generate from. So, and this is really useful for, let's say, identifying, accurately and quickly identifying 10 similar regions between the reference genome and the read. So this is basically the uh, three key steps uh, in raw hash. And then once you generate the hash value accurately, we, we can literally perform exactly the same step that we do in read mapping for sequences, right? Which means that we have, new, we have we can now use this hash table. We can identify the, remember the background site that I showed you. We can then perform some filtering, chaining, and then maybe even alignment later on, right? So it will give us the mapping positions. Uh, so uh, this is basically how it works in real time. We have this uh, hashes, so we generate hash tables, right? Uh, this is an offline step. This is done once. And in real time, you also generate the hash value from raw signals. And then we create the hash table to figure out the matching positions. And then we perform chaining and mapping by getting these mapping uh, matching positions. And then continuously in real time, uh, we decide, we ask the question to ourselves, whether we should continue mapping or not based on the mapping information we generate so far. If you are not confident, let's say, we can tell uh, yes, we want to continue mapping. So give me the next chunk of data that is generated in real time. And then we do all of these steps again and then ask the same question again. If basically we want to stop mapping, this means that maybe we reach to a conclusion, we can use these features that are known as read until or until, uh, tell none of course sequencer that it needs to stop sequencing so that we can also stop mapping. So I see a question from Fukam. Maybe I can answer it uh, now. So yeah. Um... So you're concatenating uh, small k-mers so that they are good enough for uh, low collision hash environments, right? So, exactly. uh, so on average, uh, how long are your uh, uh, chained k-mers, like new k-mers, mm -hmm. long ones? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. So we did some empirical analysis to it. There are two main limitations. One, uh, these are five bit values. And uh, we, like in our implementation, we use 64 uh, bit variables, right? So you can at most, uh, uh, let's say fit uh, how many, like maybe, uh, I guess, uh, 40 or 16 almost, I guess, right? Uh, 16 of these events. But again, yeah. uh, each event is a six mer. So if you have 16 of these, the longest k mer that you can get is uh, around 20 mer or 21 mer if you have these uh, uh, six mers over there. But this is the maximum limit that you can get. But based on our empirical analysis, actually using 16 of these are not really accurate. So when you have these uh, consecutive of these uh, next to each other, we're not finding many accurate regions. So our uh, the number of events that we're packing is around from five to nine. Uh, uh, right, five to nine, six mers. For viral genomes, for smaller genomes, we have lower uh, number of packings because the genome itself is small, but it can still give us good resolution. For larger genomes, we increase the number of events so that we can find fewer regions for larger genomes so that we can also reduce uh, our search space as well. But very recently, with Love Hash 2, actually, this is going to be modified soon as well in our paper. We've actually come up with a better quantization mechanism which enables us to increase that number of events to even larger number of, let's say, uh, values. And this actually improved our accuracy and also performance a lot. And hopefully we'll have those results very soon. So I'm, uh, maybe this is the first time I'm even revealing this. <laughs> That's a nice question. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, if there are no other questions, maybe I can continue. Okay, I don't see any, I'll continue. So this is basically how we do real-time decisions. Uh, with the limited time, I'll very quickly, very quickly show you how sequence until works. This is uh, a bit relevant, uh, irrelevant to raw hash, but it essential. The synergy is really well with raw hash uh, because we can perform real time analysis for larger genomes, and this is actually useful for metagenomics data sets. So, sequence until mechanism the problem with sequence until mechanism that we're tackling is. Unnecessary sequencing, of course, wastes time, power, money, and so on, right? And we want to stop that. We want to stop doing that. And the key idea with sequence central, we want to dynamically decide 
if further sequencing of the entire sample is necessary to achieve high accuracy, right? Maybe you can stop at a time and you can still uh, answer your question that you're seeking for, right? Without sequencing the entire sample. And if so, we can stop sequencing early without sacrificing accuracy. And there are certain potential benefits to it. We can reduce significantly reduce the sequencing time and cost if we can stop, se uh, the, stop sequencing the entire run uh, completely. And we have this example use case, which is relative advanced estimation, where you have this metagenomics, let's say, organisms. Uh, you have multiple organisms in your sample, and you want to identify what is the ratio of that particular organism compared to that organism and so on, right? This is the ratio that you want to generate. And the key steps in sequence until is as follows. What we do is uh, we continue to generate relative advanced estimation, right? After every sequencing of n reads. So I assume you have you sequence thousand reads. Now we can do relative advanced estimation and then see what is your uh, estimation, right? And then we do this for we keep basically the last t estimations that we generated so far, right? So now you have t estimations. You have the previous estimations and the, the most current one. And then we ask the question whether there is an outlier in any of these estimations. So what this means is that if we have, if there is an absence of outlier, then this means that we're actually generating consistent, consistent results. So this means that further sequencing is likely to generate also consistent results. So you can stop sequencing the entire run because there is no outlier, so we're confident. But if there is an outlier, then this means that our recent sequencing changes our, our estimation as well. So then this means that, oh, maybe we need to keep sequencing because we haven't reached to a consensus yet and so on. So if you can answer this, this can stop the entire sequencing run uh, at once. So this is sequence until, and I'll hopefully show you some results with that. So I'll show you our evaluation methodology with raw hash. We compared the, the state of dark mechanisms, uh, uncoat and SIGMAP. We used our uh, uh, CPU to do so, and we assigned 32 threads for each tool. And our use cases is one, read mapping. Second is relative balance estimation that I just described. And the third is contamination analysis, where you try to identify whether your sample is contaminated by a certain organism or not. And we measured throughput, which is how fast our each tool is. We also measured the potential reduction in sequencing time and cost, which is related to how quickly you can do your uh, stopping decision. And also we measured our read mapping accuracy. And now for read mapping accuracy, our baseline is the mapping information that is generated using Minimap2, and then we measured precision recall and F1 score, and also the advanced estimation, uh, estimations and so on. We have various data sets from viral genome to human genome. And for the advanced estimation, we uh, create a mock community by, by concatenating uh, all of these data sets together. And for contamination analysis, we uh, merge viral data set with human and then ask question whether the uh, uh, the sample is contaminated by uh, the COVID uh, genome and so on. So I'll first show you the throughput results. Here on the x-axis, we have the data sets, and on the y-axis, we have the throughput results of each tool. And uh, the basically the tester is better, and the throughput of nanopore sequencer is 450 basis per second. So this means that if a bar is above that uh, line, then this means that the tool can achieve real-time analysis. And if it is below that bar, uh, line, it, is, it cannot achieve real-time analysis because it is below the throughput of nanopore. And then what we show is that first, raw hash provides significant improvements in the, in the, uh, in the performance because we seem to do fast hash-based search rather than maybe distance calculation. And the sigma, which is based on distance-based calculation tool, cannot perform real-time analysis for large genomes because of how costly it is. So the second is uh, we focus on uncalled and raw hash results uh, to, to show how quickly we can uh, essentially stop sequencing. And then here, the lower is better. Uh, and what we see is that for larger genomes, uh, uh, which is green algae and human genome here, uh, raw hash provides uh, up to 1.3x uh, reduction in the sequencing time and cost. And with the newer uh, versions, actually, this is, these results still are much better. And we also check the read mapping accuracy. So we calculate like what is the F1 score of each tool for each data set and so on. So for larger genomes, we see significant improvements in the accuracy, almost 2x improvement compared to other tools. And for smaller genomes, although the first version of raw hash is less, slightly less accurate, it is actually close. It provides close accuracy to, to other tools. Again, with the new versions, <laughs> I'm happy to tell you that actually the old, for all data sets, raw hash provides best accuracy. 
Uh, so we look at also the accuracy of the ones estimation, and then similarly we see that the estimation that we're generating in low hash is much more accurate than the other tools. And also when you integrate sequence until, and then you run it dynamically, and then you let the sequence until decide when to stop sequencing for the to balance estimation, what we see is that the estimation that it generates at the end is very close to the, uh, the original estimation that low hash generates with uh, using the 100% of the entire sample, but sequence until stops sequencing it after sequencing 7% of the entire sample. So this translates into almost 15x reduction in the sequencing time and cost without sacrificing from accuracy a lot. So we also simulate, let's say, benefits of sequence until, not just on raw hash, but also on uncode. And then what we see is that we actually can provide even up to 100x reductions in sequence uh, for sequencing time and cost. So we have more results in the paper, so you can see like more detailed results and also uh, the details about the um, configurations and then so on. So this is the link to the paper and also QR code, but you'll also have the slides, so you can check these later on. Uh, and we also have these, we have continuous, we have continuous collaborations in many groups with raw hash. So there are actually many other upcoming features uh, on top of raw hash. Uh, so what I want to really also mention is one last thing is, since now we can generate hash values, accurate hash values from raw signals. So this also enables using the existing sketching mechanisms out there, for example, minimizers, stopmers, or, or blend as well, so that we can, uh, let's say, make it even more efficient for certain data sets and so on. And this is also will be in the raw hash 2 paper uh, as well. Uh, so the, for conclusion, what I really want to say is that many opportunities for raw, there are many opportunities for analyzing raw signals in real time. We can utilize now these sketching techniques and indexing is also very cheap. Maybe we can do on the fly index construction for particular use cases. And also this means that we should also rethink the algorithms to perform downstream analysis, maybe fully using raw signals without even base calling them. Maybe there are opportunities there. So this is raw hash. For raw hash to unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into detail, but uh, what I really want to say is that there are uh, certain features that makes us uh, enabling, uh, let's say, more accurate mapping decisions and also to make it uh, more accurate. We apply these frequency filters and also we do learned mapping decisions and so on to make uh, better decisions. And also we integrate minimizers and blend sketching techniques and then we see the benefits. And also uh, raw hash 2 supports these newer data formats such as POT5 and also newer nanopod chemistry such as R10 and so on. It also provides better performance, like better accuracy compared to raw hash. It's basically better in all metrics. So my conclusion slide. Uh, so what I really want to say is that the future is bright for genome analysis, for sequence analysis. So today we covered recent various ideas and recent ideas to analyzing genomes in ways that were not possible before. So we can now enable cost-effective, portable, fast, and accurate genome analysis, especially for large genomes and maybe metagenomic samples as well. And it has many implications. For example, what are the new applications that we can enable with these unique benefits, right? And also, can we do even better? For example, can we identify or can we understand and modify the sequencing process itself, maybe in nanopore, so that we can analyze other types of biological data, maybe proteins, right, or amino acids. And also, many future opportunities exist uh, with these approaches, maybe especially with new sequencing technologies, and also especially with new applications and use cases and so on. So with that, uh, I'll just show you these further uh, resources. So if you want to learn more about raw hash, so you can watch my talk here at ISMB. And also if you want to learn more about how we achieve fast genome analysis, there are various resources in our uh, YouTube channel, uh, in, in Professor Mato's YouTube channel. Uh, so you can go and uh, watch these and so on. And this is the recent paper that, uh, there's an invited paper that we published at, uh, at a conference, which we describe how you can also use hardware, right? Maybe not just GPUs, how you can literally use DRAM to perform computation, right? Without even moving the data from DRAM. And this is known as in-memory computation. Or how you can even use SSDs within itself uh, to do the computation and so on. So we describe all of these in this paper and then you can see what opportunities exist for genome analysis. And with that, uh, I'll conclude. And uh, again, if there are any other questions, I'm, I'll be very happy to, to answer them. Thanks, thanks for your attention. John, thank you so much. This was so clear. <laughs> I think the students would want more of you and less of me in the uh, upcoming pictures. <laughs> so, um, 
any questions, please, active participation is um, encouraged in this class. Questions? There is, um, they have a next, their next class starts in 10 minutes, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, I don't want to keep them too long, but I have one question. So from this raw, sig raw signal uh, generation, from the ref from the genome to the raw signal generation like what is the variance there like is that would that um i'm guessing that would have an effect on the results right is the variance small enough uh, to handle in the downstream steps mm, uh so that's i mean uh, i wouldn't i mean you wouldn't know the number but like yes we have done some experiments exactly. but yeah mm -hmm. uh, so one requirement is that you need to use that KMR table mm -hmm. for the monopole model that uh, you're using for sequencing. And because the characteristics of the signal change a lot depending on that chemistry. And uh, uh, if you use the uh, correct KMR table, mm -hmm. uh, then the, the variance is relatively small enough for us to actually achieve high accuracy, actually even for E. coli, we recently we achieved almost exactly the same uh, read mapping results with base code sequences. So this shows there is a little variance uh, in, in these KMR tables. But again, uh, the challenge is how we generate those KMR models. Usually, oxo technologies are providing those KMR tables to us. Mm -hmm. But there was a very recent paper that is called Uncalled for that was like uh, published in 10 days ago. It's mm -hmm. Uh, shows you the, me uh, the mechanism to generate your own uh, 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 lookup table uh, for the biological data that you have. Maybe in the future we'll move on to essentially dynamically constructing those uh, KMR lookup tables and then using them so that our analysis even become more more accurate. <laughs> I see. That's cool. And I was wondering, you mentioned some uh, deep learning approaches. I'm yeah, they are costly and so on, but at the training them is costly uh, even in the inference time are they costly or you have you showed some results though and i was wondering there is also quantized deep learning models right so mm -hmm. uh, have people tried out those ideas there that's true actually we have a recent publication on that quantized okay. uh, scholarly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so we, we look at how we can simplify these base colors further so that they are not going to be costly. This means that actually you don't have to use GPUs, but you can use CPUs mm -hmm. to do base calling. So if you have GPU, these base colors, even though they are complex, they are really fast. Okay. But again, the implication is you need to have a powerful GPU, maybe 800, and the power requirements of these also, the power draw of these GPUs also a lot. This means that maybe we cannot use it for portable purposes, maybe for mobile devices. But I guess the next uh, good question is, uh, how can we further simplify these base colors so that they become also useful for uh, CPUs? Uh, uh, what we observe is that they can be simplified to be used on CPU with significant accuracy uh, 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 reductions uh, in, in base coding. And this is due to, again, two reasons. One, you simplify your model. But second is these base colors are designed uh, in a way that they need to essentially get large pieces of the signal chunks. So mm -hmm. what you could really do is that you reduce your signals. Maybe you give 500 signals at a time. Maybe it is enough for you okay. for making decision, but base colors are not really effective at taking these really small uh, raw signals and then genetic. So these are really basically good challenges to tackle uh, going into the future for base colors. Upcoming research problems. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Thanks a lot, John. I think we don't have any questions from uh, so John. The class. Ah, go ahead. Do you have... Can I ask some? Sure, go ahead. Yes, please. Yeah. So uh, just to clarify, <laughs> just to make sure. So uh, you ha you showed windows of nanopore signals and you extracted um, uh, event values out of them. So does it ever occur that you have uh, different windows, one is not fluctuated at all, one is fluctuated a lot. Uh, you had kind of windows, yeah. Like so you're, you're referring to this, right? 
Yeah, the first window and the second large window. Exactly. So let's say they have same event values, but they refer to different chambers. Does exactly. Does that ever happen? Yes, so it happens. Uh, 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 because, you know, these are really statistical tests that they really don't know about the characteristics of monopore signals, right? And this statistical test may fail. And uh, we take, uh, this happens, by the way, and to prevent this from basically ruining our analysis, we do certain uh, outlier detection approaches. So first, uh, what we do is, if values are close enough to each other, if they are next to each other and if they are close enough, we want to take one of these. Uh, that's one uh, approach that we're taking. And the second is we can actually do some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, filtering within each segment as itself so that the, each segment becomes more purified. It becomes denoised also so that maybe you uh, denoise those outlier effects and, and so on. But it happens and uh, you really need to basically filter out those uh, close values to each other because of these basically uh, why? Uh, because of the reasons why this statistical test is not uh, basically accurate enough. And maybe there's a future uh, good research that can be done on top of this as well. For summary uh, terms, just exactly. Furkan yes. <laughs> yeah. is asking really nice questions, I would say. I think he can generate really nice ideas on, on top of these uh, <laughs> lectures. <laughs> really nice. Thank you. Thank you. I was actually wondering, like, can't you factor in the fluctuation as some metric? into this statistical you test. Yes, you can. For example, there's a deep select net paper that performs, um, that, that does medium calculation within segments and then uh, does outlier detection like to identify these, uh, let's say, fluctuations, if it can detect. Mm -hmm. There are filtering mechanisms to do so. But the question is, are there, could there be more accurate filtering outlier detection mechanisms? Okay. Also, one last silly question, maybe. Uh, so if you, let's say, uh, instead of completely sequencing the read, you sequence half of it. Like, mm -hmm. does it spend uh, half the energy from the flow cell? Uh, exactly half. No, no. Uh, actually, there is a limit that you need to sequence. Uh, if you sequence, let's say, uh, 10 seconds of data, it is actually better that you don't eject it. Uh, oh. Because when the DNA is sequenced long, and if you want to eject it, the DNA can actually tangle uh, the monopore, so it can block the pore. Mm. Wow. So I was going to ask about that, but then yes. uh, if it's too much of an experimental detail, maybe you would know, <laughs> but you know it. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, the, 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 it is really critical that you do your decision within maybe five or four seconds so that okay. you can do your ejection uh, uh, nicely. Okay, thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you, John, so much. Because the students have another class, um, I told them that they may leave. That that's why they are. Leaving. Um, hope to see you uh, in Turkey or in some conference. Uh, oh, thanks absolutely. a lot. This was really nice. Thanks, yeah. thank you again, Aznur Jam, and for the nice questions as well, and for this opportunity. I really appreciate it, and I hope to see you all again sometime soon. Yeah. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. bye.